Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have bees. A lot of us know bees as pretty harmless and are kind of cute little pollinators, unless of course you're allergic or terrified. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was, of course, until an experiment in the 1970s went awry and caused a new crossbred bee. This experiment was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces a lot more honey. And of course, the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment and the 80s saw the beginning of the trouble. The bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they are also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can sting multiple times. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times as many stings as regular swarms. They react to disturbances 10 times faster, and they will also chase the disturbance a quarter of a mile. Imagine. These bees have actually caused at least a thousand deaths, so it's safe to say that this is one experiment gone horribly wrong. In our number nine spot today, we have lions. In the 1980s at the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has less of a shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune systems started to fail. By 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction. There are laws that prohibit them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting for them to die naturally. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they did have. In our number eight spot today, we have the human Z. One of the most contentious and ethically charged endeavors pursued by Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, an extremely controversial Russian biologist, was his endeavor to produce a hybrid offspring between humans and apes. The goal actually was to create a superhuman soldier for military purposes, and as early as 1910, Ivanov presented his concept of achieving such a feat through the means of artificial insemination during the World Congress of Zoologists in Graz, Austria. In the 1920s, Ivanov embarked on a series of experiments aimed at creating a human-ape hybrid in French Guinea. Three female chimpanzees were selected as potential surrogate mothers, and the experiment began. However, despite his efforts, Ivanov was unable to achieve a successful pregnancy and bring about the desired hybrid offspring. Thank God. Upon his return to the Soviet Union in 1929, Ivanov sought to organize a new set of experiments involving the use of non-human ape seminal fluid and human volunteers. What human would volunteer for that? I don't know, and I don't want to know. However, these plans were met with setbacks, notably the demise of his last remaining orangutan, which delayed the commencement of the proposed endeavors. Ivanov's pursuit of creating a human-ape hybrid was met with considerable controversy and skepticism. Fair enough. The scientific community was divided, with many dismissing his ideas as unfeasible and scientifically dubious. Nevertheless, his experiments reflect a dark chapter in the history of crossbreeding experiments, highlighting the extreme lengths some scientists were willing to go to in the pursuit of scientific knowledge, even if it meant transgressing the boundaries of ethical conduct. In our number seven spot today, we have the Zonki. Another one of the strange and unsettling experiments from Ivanov involved the creation of hybrid offspring known as Zonkis, or zebruses, by crossing female zebras with donkeys. This experiment aimed to explore the possibilities of interbreeding between closely related species and were conducted during the early 20th century. The goal was to create a hybrid offspring that would exhibit a mix of characteristics from both zebra and donkey parents. These experiments were actually somewhat 
successful, leading to the birth of several zonkeys. The resulting zonkeys possessed traits from both species, with physical characteristics resembling a combination of zebras and donkeys. They often displayed striped markings on their bodies, similar to those found on zebras of course, and zonkeys typically retained the zebra's body shape as well, while inheriting certain donkey features such as a long ear and tuft tails. It's very cute. While these experiments achieved some success in producing hybrid offspring, they did face ethical concerns and criticism due to the manipulation of animal genetics for experimental purposes. In our number 6 spot today we have lions, tigers, and ligers. Crossbreeding experiments between lions and tigers have resulted in the creation of hybrid offspring known as ligers and tigans. Ligers are the result of breeding a male lion with a female tiger, while tigons are the offspring of a male tiger and a female lion. However, while these hybrids have been successful in terms of producing viable offspring, they raise significant concerns and have been regarded as ethically problematic. The primary issue with lion-tiger hybrids is related to their health and welfare. Ligers, in particular, often suffer from various health problems. Their large size, resulting from the combination of their parent species, puts a strain on their bodies, leading to skeletal and organ abnormalities. Ligers also have a higher likelihood of experiencing reproductive issues and shorten lifespans compared to their parent species. Additionally, these crossbreeding experiments are typically carried out for entertainment or commercial purposes, aiming to produce exotic and visually striking animals for display. This has raised ethical concerns about the welfare of the animals involved, as such breeding practices often prioritize profit and human fascination over the well-being of the hybrids. Moreover, these hybrid experiments highlight the blurred boundaries between species and the potential negative consequences of manipulating nature for human curiosity and amusement. While ligers and tigons may attract attention due to their very unique appearances, the ethical implications and potential harm to the animals involved have led to widespread criticism of such crossbreeding practices. In our number 5 spot today we have the farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money for them and their families. This should be amazing and great, right? Well, considering why we're all here today, I think we know the answer to that. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great things, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, but also needed way more higher quality food or else they'd stop producing more milk. And they were also less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits as well. So it's kind of like this situation of yes, they are producing more milk, well, which will get us more money, but they also cost us more, and truthfully, most of the times the increased milk production did not outweigh the growing costs. In our number 4 spot today we have the Wolfen. Wish I never had to say the word Wolfen, but unfortunately, they do exist. These guys are created when a female common bottlenose dolphin is bred with a male false killer whale. They are extremely rare and have been found in the wild, but unfortunately most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. The first recorded Wolfen was born at the Tokyo Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Probably a prime example of why maybe they shouldn't really exist in the first place. The first that was born in the United States that actually miraculously survived was at a sea life park in Hawaii in May of 1985, and her name is Kikemalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully, the third one is still living. The most recent update I could find seems seems to state that at this point, both mother and her daughter are still alive, but unfortunately they remain in captivity. In our number 3 spot today we have the beefalo. Okay. Beefalo sounds kind of cute and silly, and it also looks pretty normal, so what could be wrong with this one? Well, let's start at the beginning. A guy named Charles Buffalo Jones started breeding them in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state, and the numbers remained relatively low because of the limited hunting 
hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and there aren't any natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's wild. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that is the real trouble. First off, they are very thirsty animals and can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole, so they can obviously clear up a water source pretty quickly. Not to mention the fact that they do their business in the water and how their heavy weight compacts the soil. Basically, they have totally thrown the ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and the insects and plant life around have also been affected. In our number two spot today, we have the Pyrenean Ebex. The Pyrenean Ebex is an animal that went extinct around 2000 in a horrible turn of events. The last one was a female named Celia and she was killed in an awful falling tree incident. These animals were native to the Pyrenees mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. This is due to two things, being hunted as well as the spread of human disease. Flash forward to 2003, however, and scientists tried to bring them back to life. This is the first extinct creature that scientists ever tried to clone. That is absolutely crazy and it actually worked for seven minutes only. DNA from Celia, the last living individual of the species, was taken and implanted into the womb of a domestic goat. From here, the clone was in fact born but due to lung complications, was unable to survive for longer than seven minutes. It was a short life, but a monumental one that definitely broke new ground in the scientific world. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the human pig experiment. Back in 2017, researchers at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies achieved a significant milestone by producing the first ever human pig chimera, as reported in the journal Cell. The team used cells from an adult human to create stem cells, which were then injected into early early stage pig embryos. These embryos were implanted into female pigs and allowed to develop for several weeks. Approximately one in every 100,000 cells in the later stage pig embryos was derived from humans. In this human pig experiment, the researchers encountered trial and error in finding human stem cells that developed in alignment with the pig's embryo's timeline. The ultimate goal of such research is to potentially grow human organs within pigs for transplantation, addressing the shortage of donors. Donor organs. While this study raises possibilities for life saving organ transplants, critics argue that mixing human and animal elements crosses ethical boundaries. The National Institutes of Health in the United States has prohibited federal funding for human chimera research, although there have been indications of potential relaxation under careful monitoring. The research opens up opportunities and ethical questions, but fears of creating half human, half animal chimeras are not applicable to the study. The next challenge for the research researchers is to improve efficiency and guide the human cells to form specific organs within the pig hosts. Starting our list off at number 10, the turkey fake out. Okay, this one is pretty hilarious. I have to start off our list here, especially in a dark list about crossbreeding, come on. Back in the 60s, turkey biologists in Pennsylvania thought, you know what, what if a male turkey was in a room with a fake turkey? Yeah, a fake female turkey. Would he try and flirt with it? Would he, I am legend, this fake turkey? What would happen? Well, the answer is yes. These male turkeys would try and mate with a fake turkey, which is funny, but by the end of the test, they were really surprised more than anything. They would just have the head of a turkey on a stick and these dudes still came out like, hey, what's going on? You single? What's up? <laughs> what's happening? It didn't matter. It was just the head and the rest didn't matter. The sticks chicks over here are catching every turkey's attention, but why? Why don't they care about the body? What's going on? Like biologically, this makes no sense. The scientific conclusion here, yes, there was one, was that the turkey fixates on the head when it comes to finding a mating partner, which is honestly pretty sweet. They're holding eye contact the whole time, even with their bobby weird heads. They're still like, hey, it's just you and me. Let's talk. Number nine, the gastric brooding frog. Okay, now we're back. Now, immediately back to business. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Okay, we're getting scientific now. I'm a big fan of frogs, except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. We don't like those. Our editors also don't like those clips either. I found out the hard way. I'm like, yeah, insert clip of a frog coming out of other frogs back from 129. They're like, please God, no. So, bless your soul. Give the thumbs up for our editors today. Thumbs up for all of our editors today. We give them horrible, horrible links they have to put together and make into art. These frogs, not so bad. These frogs would swallow their eggs and they would hatch them out of their mouth. 
Honestly, they're fascinating creatures. And with the recent Lazarus project, scientists are trying to bring the Australian gastric brooding frog back from extinction. So we can see, wah, we can see all that again in person. We can see them. Honestly, I think the back stuff's better now that I think about it. A frog coming out of a mouth, ooh. Wah. It went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have now figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Yeah, just zombie frogs, I guess. Zombie frogs that give birth through their mouths. Do we know what we're doing here? Sounds weird when you say it out loud. Up, 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 up. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys out of extinction, we're looking good. We're looking better, rather. Number eight, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to include my girl Martha on this list. The passenger pigeon, she once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was back in the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange pigeons would paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Beautiful, could you imagine? Flocks that block, we love it. But only a few decades passed, and passenger pigeons are now no more. They're entirely extinct. Sad stuff. The very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction, and we found a key. Possibly we could bring Martha back. I don't know why I did that, it's pretty dark. Like a little bird. <laughs> Wouldn't work at all. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the nicest looking pigeon. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now we have hope, right there. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeoteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm glad science is allowing us to try again, but look at the pigeons we have now. What's gonna happen to these guys? They're hardcore. Pigeons now will walk onto the subway. They'll ask you what time it is. They don't care. These graceful birds from the 1910s, I don't think they're ready. That's like a back to the future. That's like hot tub time machine type. I'm like, ah, uh, you guys won't get along. Number seven, woolly rhinoceros. Since I mentioned the revival of woolly mammoths in part one, what better time to mention this hairy beast? The woolly rhino, okay. I oddly want to pet him, weirdly. Once upon a time, these rhinos were common throughout Europe and Asia. They were all prepared for the cold tundra, hence the fur, the thick blanket of fur. Just like the woolly mammoth, right? They adapt to survive. So no ice age will stop this rhino. Ideally, that was the, that was the plan. I mean, it didn't help them out entirely, but it was mostly humans needing food and warmth that led to their extinction. So cut to 14,000 years later, we're trying to apologize. We're trying to make it up to them by bringing them back to life. It's a little hotter now, good luck. The same company responsible for the Mammoth Project is also trying to bring back this hairy boy. I mean, yeah, again, I'm all for science, but if these species died out that long ago, will highways help them? Imagine running into one of these. Number six. Megatherium. We talked about bringing back woolly rhinos and woolly mammoths, so what other Ice Age cast members can we potentially see on the highway? Perhaps the Megatherium, aka the giant sloth? I, why are we doing this? What if this works? We don't want to see this. Sloths used to be mm -hmm, a lot bigger than we think, folks. We often laugh at them for being slow and stuff. The movie Ice Age, sure, it didn't help their case. But we learn, we learn stuff, like the dodo bird, we're bringing them back. Sloths. We're also bringing them back. Of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth, but luckily for us, today's sloths aren't the size of an elephant. That would be a horror film if we brought these back. Like, let's just leave normal sloths. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off thousands of years ago due to DNA samples. Yeah, we got some DNA samples extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now that's waiting for us is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part, but we're very close. Too close, I'd say. Stop. If you're working on any, you know, Megatherium science projects, just, you know, chill. Just chill out for a bit. Number five, spider art. For a nice halfway point here, I have to mention NASA's 1995 spider test, which sounds really scary, but it's not that bad. Hear me out. When nature meets science, we often get jarring results, be it hybrid animals, clones, you name it. Spiders, as fascinating as they already are, can be even more mysterious especially when they're exposed to mind-altering illicit substances. Yeah, just some hardcore stuff. NASA wanted to determine the toxicity between said substances and what differences they may look like. Spiders are fascinating. We can literally see how they think and survive. 
We see it up close when we walk through them and go, oh, ew, ew, gross, but we never see them like this, right? Caffeinated behavior is all over the place. It doesn't look like a normal spider at all, but with hallucinogens, it's the same shape, but it's almost missing steps, right? Little differences between all these tests. I don't think any animal should have coffee, period. I don't think an espresso goes well with any bug. Yeah, trust, trust me. I'm all jacked up on coffee right now. The moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago, and I'm pretty glad. They're absolutely terrifying. They were flightless birds, uh, massive, hence the flightlessness, and archaeologists first discovered a fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. It looked something out of a horror movie. It was terrible. These ancient birds would reach around five or six feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think, oh, that's, that's quite petite. No, this is horrible. The birds stopped flying right after these dinosaurs went extinct. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make, you know, daring dinoscapes. So they got fat, they walked around, they stopped flying, and they just retired. Then they would hang out in caves and just eat good. Phillips says this is an advantage when it came to birds in evolution because wings, big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature, yeah, lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating better, right? Eh, I would rather eat really well than fly, to be honest. I can't even fly now, and I'm like, eh, I'd still rather just eat a lot. Again, why are we mixing DNA of a dinosaur with new birds? This is where we turn into Jurassic Park. Any minute. Next year, I'll be like, hey, top 10 animals that made the test, and now we're screwed. Number three, the stellar sea cow. Stellar indeed. Yeah, the stellar sea cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive creature back in the mid-1700s during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely little surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were all over the place two million years ago. They were no match for humans at all. They only swam around a meter deep, and once humans came into the picture much later, they were very easy to hunt. They were fat little blubber balls just that would sit in shallow water. I mean, come on, you just... George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which made it even easier to hunt. Considering the one year gestation period, the species couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But with this list, we have a little hope, right? That's why I'm here. Hi, now you're sad. I'm here to make your day a little happier. Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which means that we may see these creatures very soon, one day. Hopefully soon. The answer may lie in the DNA of a dugong. Yeah, dugongs are the cow of the sea, so what better relative to kind of pick apart and maybe crossbreed. Number two, the mouse with an ear on its back. And we're right back to horrible stuff, okay. If we ever reboot Stuart Little, this guy needs to audition, he's killing it. The mouse with a human ear, folks. This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. This is horrible. What are we looking at here? Why did someone do this? Well, back in 1997, this mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, AKA cells from a cow. Well, it worked, and we're still talking about it, obviously, because it's the weirdest thing I've ever looked at. Yeah, Joseph began designing human organs, and this was during a shortage where human organs wasn't just like, you know, common, easy thing to get. He wasn't just bored and, you know, started making ears. He was, he was changing the medical game, okay? And little did he know he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear, a fake ear, then told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob not to bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a mouse. But Chuck, obviously, because of what happened, he, he spilled the beans, he told a few friends. But now, we all know how cow cartilage can create cells, so a little secret became great science. I really want a Q-tip his back. Is that weird? I want a Q-tip the mouse with an ear on its back's ear. Back. And finally, number one, the multi-dog. Okay, crossbreeding experiments from hell. Let's finish on a really messed up one. The multi-dog. This was back in the 50s when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a well, a multi-headed dog. Time Magazine covered it, of course. This is a feat in science. As cruel as it is, of course, this was a big deal. The adult dog had a newborn pup grafted to its neck. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics. It was playful, it was growling, it would lick people's hand and stuff like that, just as the other dog's characteristics would be, in its own unique way. It's a sad 1950s Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive a long time, but crossbreeding experiments from hell, that's, that's why we're here. This is the note that we're gonna end on. Starting off this countdown, we have the rat pigs. The Salk Institute for Biological Studies in the US has been known to run a number of crossbreeding experiments. One was performed on rats and pigs. The team of scientists decided to take stem cells from rats and inject them into pig blastocysts. However, 
this failed. And I mean, I'm not surprised. Rats and pigs have different gestation times, and genetically, they are very different. But imagine a pig that looked like a rat. Okay, that is terrifying. In our ninth spot, we had the human Z attempts. In 1967, scientists in China were working on creating a human chimp mix. Sadly, not much information about these experiments have been disclosed to the public. But rumor has it that the experiments didn't really work. They wanted to basically create a chimp that could talk fluently in whatever language it was taught. Then in 1981, they tried this experiment again. They impregnated a female chimpanzee with human sperm. Turns out, the chimp did manage to get pregnant by it, but sadly passed away three months later due to complications. Coming in at number 8, we have the rat mouse. Scientists at the Salk Institute have found a way to grow the pancreatic tissue of a mouse inside of a rat. The mouse pancreas was able to grow inside of rats successfully. So they grew these new pancreases from mouse stem cells that were then placed in the bodies of the rats. And then when the pancreases were complete, they transplanted them back into the mice. Now the biggest thing about this experiment is that this technique could reverse diabetes in the mice. So they hope that one day they can grow organs inside the bodies of different animals and then you transplant those organs into humans to cure diabetes. Of course, there's still so much work to be done on this. The last thing they want is to grow a human organ inside of an animal and then have the recipient's body reject it. In our seventh spot, we have the killer bees. Did you know that killer bees were accidentally created by scientists? If they're out here creating bees that threaten the ecosystem, then who's to say they won't create animals that do the same? Basically, this all started in the 1950s. A biologist was commissioned by the Brazilian government to create a species of bees that would increase honey production. But along the way, things went wrong. The biologist himself didn't have much experience with animal breeding. In the end, bees from southern Africa and local Brazilian honeybees mated and it produced these angry killer bees. And then of course, thousands of these bees just accidentally escaped. Now they get their name because when pissed off, they have been known to chase people down for more than a quarter mile. And on top of that, their stings are very painful. These bees are also aggressive towards other bees as well. So it puts them at risk and now we're kind of just stuck with them. In our sixth spot today we have the human mouse. In the late 90s, three doctors started doing experiments to try and create human body parts in a lab. One of these experiments involves growing a human ear on the back of a mouse. So they did this by creating an ear shaped scaffolding and putting cells of cartilage from a cow on it. They then put the mouse under anesthetic and placed this ear under its skin. Crazily enough, the mouse's body fed the cow cartilage cells. The scaffolding dissolved and the mouse grew this artificial shape of a human ear. But it was only the outside of an ear. Okay, it didn't work, there was no eardrum. Now you might be wondering why they did this. Well, their hope is that this will help plastic surgeons when reconstructing human ears for their patients. So they would create this ear on the mouse and then graft it onto the person. So you'd have an ear that is part mouse, part cow. We are now at our fifth and half mark with the goat with human milk. I swear I didn't make this up, it's real and I'm a little disturbed. But basically, scientists have figured a way for goats to produce human breast milk. They did this by transferring human breast milk enzymes and proteins into goat embryos. In the end, they found that the milk the goats were producing wasn't 100% human, but it contained 60% of the lysosome and lactoferrin found in human milk. Now, why do they want goats producing human breast milk? Well, it could feed and save babies in need. Plus, it would have a longer shelf life. Would you try this milk? Let me know in the comments below. I've heard breast milk is pretty sweet, but I don't think I wanna try it. Coming in at number four, we have the Belgian super cow. Now, you guys know how much I love cows. And if you didn't know, then hi, my name is Lindsay and I love cows. But this thing is terrifying. It's monstrous, okay? It's super ripped and it's just massive. The Belgian super cows were created back in the 1800s when Belgian scientists and farmers mixed native cattle with shorthorn cattle. Then over the time, they would select the biggest and strongest offsprings of each variety and then breed them together. So on and so on, bam! 
you got a super cow, which is definitely the biggest and strongest, and I understand why they call it the super cow. Like, just look at this beast, okay? It could crush anyone. In our third spot, we have the Enviro Pig. So pig waste is actually pretty toxic. I mean, if you've seen the Simpsons movie, then you'd know all about it. I mean, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but still. Anyways, pig's waste contains really high levels of phosphorus. This phosphorus ends up in lakes and rivers and oceans and can cause a boom of algae. So scientists were trying to come up with a way for pigs to have less toxic waste, hence the creation of the Enviro Pig. Enviro Pigs are pigs with up to 65% less phosphorus in their excretements. This pig was first created in 1999 at the University of Guelph's Farm in Canada. This pig had its phytase gene attached to a piece of mouse DNA. Now it's really complicated to explain, but here's an explanation, and I quote, the genetically altered pig was created using genetic material from a mouse and an E. coli bacterium to reduce phosphorus in the pig's feces. In the end, it made the pig excrete fewer pollutants. Moving on to number two, we have the pig with human blood. Now you're probably noticing a trend by now. Pigs and mice are the scientists' test subjects of choice. Researchers at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota have managed to create pigs made out of human blood. So the pigs have human blood pumping through their veins. Not only that, but some of the cells in the blood merge together to create pig-human cell hybrids. Now, the reason behind this all is to allow scientists to study how viral infections can transfer from animals to humans. And in our number one spot today, we have Oliver the Chimp. In the 1970s, there was a performing chimpanzee that received a lot of attention. His name was Oliver. Now, Oliver was really different from other chimps for a number of reasons. The main being that Oliver might have been a successful mix between a human and a chimp. Yeah, you heard me. A lot of doctors and scientists are convinced that Oliver was a human Z. It's believed that they inseminated a female chimp with male sperm and Oliver was the offspring. Now let's take a look at the facts. Oliver didn't look like other chimps. In fact, he had a more human-like appearance. He had a flatter face than other chimpanzees and he walked on two feet instead of all fours. He also preferred human females over female chimpanzees and he understood humans very well. So could it be that Oliver was actually half human, half chimp? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the mule. The humble mule, a creature born of a union between a male donkey and a female horse, is a testament to the incredible diversity of life and the possibilities of crossbreeding. This hybrid offspring has been an invaluable asset to humanity for centuries, embodying a perfect balance of strength, speed, endurance, and sure-footedness. Mules are remarkable creatures that beautifully combine the best characteristics of their parent species. However, the mule's hybrid nature comes with a biological cost. Typically, mules are sterile, a consequence that's commonly observed in hybrid species. This sterility stems from the mismatch in the number of chromosomes of their parent species, which prevents successful reproduction. Despite this genetic setback, mules have carved a very unique niche in human societies. Their remarkable abilities have made them indispensable in various sectors, including agriculture, transportation, and even warfare. The humble mules contribution to human civilization is a testament to its resilience and adaptability, qualities that make this hybrid creature a fascinating subject of study. In our number 9 spot today we have the Iron Age Pig. Now brace yourself for an animal so wild it might as well have time traveled straight from the Iron Age to your screen. We're talking about the Iron Age Pig, a real porky paradox born from a cross between your friendly neighborhood domestic pig and the not so friendly wild boar. You'd think Think being half domestic, these little critters would be up for a snuggle, right? Well, wrong. Despite packing some serious resilience in their porcine bodies, these hogs are about as sociable as a grizzly with a toothache. Their aggression levels are dialed up to 11, making them about as farm friendly as a pack of velociraptors. So what's the moral of this little piggy tail? Well, it turns out playing mother nature isn't as easy as it sounds. The Iron Age pig experiment ended up being less eureka and more, uh oh, a big snorting reminder that when it comes to tampering with the blueprint of life, maybe we should leave it to the pros. 
In short, these bristly hybrids stand as living, grunting proof that not every trip down memory lane is a stroll in the park. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Hinny. Picture this, the sprinting stamina of a racehorse and the stubborn grit of a donkey, all rolled into one. Welcome to the fascinating, if a bit troublesome, life of a Hinny. This peculiar beast is what you get when you mix a male horse's speed and a female donkey's tenacity. Despite the fact that they could probably outlast a marathon runner and have lifespans that would make a tortoise nod in approval, hennies don't exactly have it easy. For starters, they usually can't have little hennies of their own. Yeah, nature hit them with a sterile tag, just like the mules. And then there's the elephant in the room. Or should we say the horse and donkey in the room? They've got a mum who's petite and a dad who's, well, horsier. The mismatch is like trying to blend a sports car with a minivan. The result is awkward. In the end, the life of a henny is a cautionary tale straight from nature's own genetic soap opera. A clear memo that when it comes to stirring up the gene pool, sometimes you might end up with a cocktail that's a little bit more bitter than sweet. In our number seven spot today, we have the Savannah Cat, a product of love or science. Between a domestic cat and a serval, this feline is a strange cocktail of domestic cuddles and wild prowling. These guys don't do things by halves, they are the true embodiment of go big or go home. And by big, I mean double the size of your regular tabby, akin to swapping your cuddly kitten for a mini panther. And these bigger bodies house some pretty wild tendencies, a bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but in feline form. However, this mix of house pet and wild cat isn't just a spectacle, it's a little bit of a ticking time bomb. Let's face it, nobody wants their morning coffee interrupted by their pet tiger, I mean cat, chasing local wildlife or causing a ruckus. It's this fine line between awe inspiring and eyebrow raising that makes the savannah cat ethical puzzle in the world of crossbreeding. In our number 6 spot today we have the mule bird. The mule bird is a one of a kind melody maker born from the union of a canary and a goldfinch, a musical marvel you might say. But uh, hold on to your feathers, because this birdie's tail is as unsettling as it is intriguing. You see, the mule bird is not just another chirper in the aviary. It's an aria virtuoso, belting out tunes that would make even Pavarotti's heart flutter. But as they say, every rose has its thorns, and our songbird friend here comes with its own bittersweet symphony. For all their musical prowess, mule birds are the tragic heroes of the bird world. Despite their captivating chorus, they've been dealt a cruel hand by nature, or should we say, by us. They're sterile, forever singing solos without the chance to create a choir of their own. And this is where we, the audience, have to take a bow. We bred these birds for our amusement, crafting a creature that could never craft a lineage of its own. A poignant reminder of the Pandora's box that is crossbreeding, where human curiosity can sometimes strike a discordant note. In our number 5 spot today we have the Lepon. Leopon. Lepon. Whatever you you prefer. It's a magnificent creature that'll leave you both fascinated and slightly disconcerted. A head like a regal lion, complete with a majestic mane paired with a sleek and agile leopard body. It's a blend of two of nature's most iconic feline species, resulting in a mesmerizing and puzzling spectacle. The lepin's rarity is truly a sight to behold. You won't find these hybrids roaming the wild. They are a product of human intervention, born in captivity, where biology took took a turn down a very peculiar path. It's a reminder of the lengths we humans sometimes go to bend nature to our will. Apparently we couldn't resist the temptation to create such a majestic mashup. But let's not forget the questions this creature raises. Does the lepin represent a triumph in human ingenuity or a meddling with mother nature's design? Should we be playing Dr. Frankenstein with the building blocks of life? These are philosophical ponderings that tickle the brain as we admire these hybrids. In our number four spot today we have the narluga, mostly on this list just because I wanted to say the word narluga. Prepare to have your senses confounded as we delve into the depths of this peculiar crossbreed, born from the unlikely fusion of a narwhal and a beluga whale. Through the marvels of scientific scrutiny, DNA analysis of these very peculiar looking whale skulls has confirmed the existence of the narluga. But let me tell you, this hybrid is not your ordinary seaside mashup. It's a creature that walks the line 
line between awe and unease. Imagine a majestic narwhal, its sleek body elegantly adorned with a spiraling tusk, entwined with the playful charm of a beluga whale. It's a fantastical creation that seems to defy nature's conventional boundaries, leaving us both mesmerized and slightly unnerved. As we gaze upon this remarkable example of crossbreeding in wild cetaceans, we can't help but wonder, what other surprises does nature hold? Are there more uncanny blends lurking beneath the surface? In our number 3 spot today, we have a growler bear. This enigmatic creature, born from the extraordinary union of polar bears and grizzly bears, is a captivating blend of nature's mightiest beasts. As climate change wreaks havoc on our planet, the boundaries of bear territories are being reshaped. Polar bears, driven by warming temperatures, venture further south, while grizzlies, seeking cooler climates, migrate north. And lo and behold, in the midst of this changing landscape, the territories of these noble creatures begin to overlap, leading to the emergence of rare hybrids. The Growler Bears With their unique combination of traits, the Growler Bears possess the adaptability of both the open tundra and the dense forests. They're like nature's bold experiment in a climate change adaptation, straddling the line between two contrasting habitats. It's a very fascinating glimpse into the way that these magnificent creatures navigate the shifting world that they inhabit, but let's not forget the disconcerting undertone. The very existence of the Growler Bear highlights the plight of these majestic species forced to intermingle due to the encroaching impacts of climate change. In our number 2 spot today we have the Kama. Through the power of artificial insemination, the Kama came into existence. A blend of the camel's imposing size and strength with the llama's more manageable temperament. It's a very bizarre concoction that raises both eyebrows and curiosity. Just imagine a creature roaming the earth with the body of a camel and the endearing charm of a llama. A sight to behold indeed, yet in the grand tapestry of hybrid creations, the Kama remains a very uncommon marvel. Only a few of these extraordinary beings grace our world, making them a very elusive sight, even among the vast array of crossbreeds. Their rarity adds an air of mystique to their existence, leaving us with a sense of wonder, and yet a hint of unease. While the intention behind the Kama's creation was to combine desirable traits, we can't help but question the boundaries we push in the name of scientific exploration. What does it mean to meddle with nature's design, reshaping creatures for our own purposes? The Kama serves as a reminder that with great power comes great responsibility. In our number one spot today, we have the Jag Lion. A magnificent blend of a male jaguar and a female lion, boasting a combination of very powerful physical traits and stunning markings. But as we marvel at this majestic creature, let us not forget the deeper ethical complexities that lurk beneath its mesmerizing surface. The jag lion is a rare gem, a product of human intervention in the delicate world of crossbreeding large cat species. Its existence serves as a stark reminder of the ethical quandaries that arise when we meddle with the natural order of things. While the jag lion captivates us with its undeniable beauty, it also forces us to question the impact of our actions on the creatures that roam this earth. Sure, the jag lion is truly a sight to behold, with its fierce jaguar traits melded seamlessly with the regal presence of the lion, but we must pause and reflect upon the intricate web of consequences that follow such hybrid creations. Is it right for us to manipulate nature's course, blurring the lines between species and tampering with the delicate balance of ecosystems? Number 10, the chimpanzee human, also referred to as humanzees which is fun to say. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees, DNA-wise. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with these hairy fellows. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A human Z was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Avanov inseminated female chimps with human DNA, but it didn't work. Or did it? Things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene in the 70s. Yeah, he was walking like a human, which we've never really seen before. He was referred to as the missing link because of his appearance and the way you would act. He was previously a performance animal, he was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day. Which is, yeah, I agree. Also, I remember seeing chimps in family movies, I'm pretty sure. Remember those movies growing up where chimpanzees were like snowboarding or playing hockey? Most extreme primate, that was it. That's where we're at, chimpanzees doing barrel rolls and hockey stops. My friends, we're already there. I think we're already at the Planet of the Apes terrifying point. We're screwed if one of these experiments works, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, 
Human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles talking about chimps. Time to get into the real scary science. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research, obviously. The whole idea was to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. I like these projects because we're moving forward, at least. We're not just doing it because we're like, eh, let's see if we can bring dinosaurs back. We're trying to find a solution. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows. Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class, okay? There's other ways to wake up in the morning. Let's just leave cows alone for like a bit, maybe? Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with the human and skin cells. And then in a little time, the egg can develop and turn into a blastocyst, aka a cloned embryo. And there we have stem cells for said science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go here with DNA mixing? How much DNA are we going to mix before we're like, stop? Things could go south. For example, just like the number eight. Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a time even before horses arrived, so they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons, and smaller ones would help pulling plows and smaller loads. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol back then. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Nice, yummy. Oh, I wonder what this one is. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a kunga. It's gotta be a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, it's crazy what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from thousands of years ago. Science is incredible. It's more amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Kinda seems like we could use them. Number seven, woolly mammoth. It was announced less than a year ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a new biosciences and genetics company called Colossal, they got the funding finally for quite this project. They're planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. Yep, instead of just paying off student loans, they're like, how about we bring a mammoth back? Let's just see if we can do that. That'll solve some problems. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago. But what if we had these hairy goliaths back again today? The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these guys, but climate change began to slow them down. Also, humans needing food definitely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and well, obviously look at them, lots of food. So they died off quite quick. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. And they're on the way, they're, they're doing it right now. That's happening as we speak. A mammoth is being born. They're using the CRISPR gene editing tool, which is a fun tool, I guess. Elephants are still kicking around and their genomes combined with the preserved mammoth DNA is the magic trick. So if you see mammoths trending on Twitter in four to six years, well, you know why. There's not another Ice Age movie. It's definitely just a real mammoth. Number six, Pyrenean ibex. The Pyrenean ibex also went extinct a long time ago. This was much sooner though than mammoths. This was around 2000. The last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly ended her life. Of all the ways to go, really? Come on, man, that's sad. It was a subspecies of the Spanish ibex. They were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level because of, you know, knights and swords and bows equals lunch, right? So the numbers dipped. More than fair, this army's to feed, but in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean ibex to return. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven whole minutes. Yeah, seven minutes in heaven, or seven minutes out of heaven, rather. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Yeah, a little goat, a little goat hybrid. Lung complications are why the clone sadly didn't last, but we had a hybrid medieval animal for seven minutes. We're getting close. Number five, the super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Introducing the super cow. Okay, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache. <laughs> your super pants. My god, I can't do milk anymore. Only in Belgium. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmers brought together native cattle and short horn cattle to make this hybrid animal. After that, they would literally just pick the biggest cows of the bunch and then have them breed together and then so on and so forth. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. I can't even look at them. God, they're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. Just, it makes no sense. How does, what? Where does that come from? Let's move on. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s, also quite recently. Major factors here are as, you know, you guessed what I said earlier, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. All those combined, it's just no chance. It's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's also recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back to life. Hey, what's up? Hey, you've been asleep, bye. Hybrid science, there we go, let's get mixing.
open. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? I think we're ready. Let's jazz up some trails by introducing these guys. Specimens of the Tasmanian tiger still remain preserved in jars. No idea who has them or why, but we'll move on from that. Thank God for those jars. So we have Tasmanian tiger genes present, so scientists can now insert them into a mouse fetus. They just combine fetus of a mouse in DNA. I, I do this a lot. This is how I explain, I'm gonna explain this to my kids and be like, hey, this is how, how, how the human life cycle works. You just do this with your hands a lot and then you're alive. They're still lacking the full DNA to successfully recreate it, but they're close. A recent $5 million donation to the University of Melbourne earlier this year allowed for researchers to create a research lab. So yep, they were actually getting very close. They're like making the lab to make this thing. I'm like, ooh, they're gonna do it. Number three, the Great Razor Auk. Ah uh, yes, once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the Great Auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were cute, but quite defenseless, these little guys. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and or eating, and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were hanging out, so they disappeared fast. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Eldie Island, just off the coast of Iceland. And that was it. They were gone. Until now. Nice. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs. Remember those guys in jars and the organs that I talked about? Yep. Classic organs in jars. Always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed ox. So now we get a Nice fun hybrid again. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, so keep it up. Keep bringing things back from extinction. Just not humans, I don't want zombies, please. Number two, lions. Back in the 80s in the Chatbir Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together domestic lions and African lions in the hopes that they would just be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a step forward, we love those. But the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and was like, you know what? We're gonna save you guys, get out of the circus. Then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions, so. I mean, from circus to science, it's like, eh, you're still sorry. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake from the get-go. The cubs already had severely weak back legs, they were having trouble walking as they got older, their immune system started to fail, and by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. So they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. There are luckily laws that prohibited them from killing these animals, so at this point, we're just waiting for them to die naturally, which sucks, but it's definitely better. And finally, number one, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the islands of Maridius located in the Indian Ocean. They were awesome. We've seen them in ice ages. They're all funny and big and furry. They had massive talons. They were gray and blue. They were gorgeous and Best part of all, they didn't have any natural predator until, you know, us, we, until we came around. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and well, the rest is history, and or lunch. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, they were not 100% to blame here. Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal basically that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch, so it didn't take long for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but could it be? Could we bring back said dodo birds? Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart there and bringing them back to life via hybrid science. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring the bird back. I mean, yeah, I'm all for the idea of bringing an animal back to life. Scientifically, that's definitely a feat in itself, but how long before these things are on hot ones, you know? Like dodo chicken wings? Now that I've said it, you kind of want one, right? Now you feel bad. There we go, hit that thumbs up so we don't feel guilty in the future. In our number 10 spot, we have Vladimir Demikov. Vladimir is a scientist from the Soviet Union that tried to create a two-headed dog. Not making this up. Not in the regular crossbreeding way that you may assume. He literally amputated the body of one of the dogs and attached it to the other. This honestly makes me sick to talk about. The dogs only lasted four days before passing away, and guess what? He did it again. He did it again. The next experiment ended up with two dogs living for about a month. But guess what? He literally had no purpose for these experiments. Just the ego satisfaction of being able to say that he did it. Well, thankfully he didn't because he doesn't deserve any satisfaction or praise. Just gross. In our number nine spot, we have Paracelsus. 
Paracelsus is known for being a Swiss physician, scientist, and alchemist in the 1500s during the Renaissance. He didn't necessarily experiment with crossbreeding humans with animals, but he did experiment with making humans tiny and ginormous. Also, he was seemingly evil slash insane, so I just wanted to put him on this list. Paracelsus was convinced he could grow giants and tiny humans by growing them from a jar of Yep. Apparently he would keep the jar in a warm place and feed the creatures blood to make them grow. I can just see him sprinkling in some blood into that jar. <laughs> Apparently he was quite successful and managed to grow tiny humans, but allegedly the small creatures turned on him and ran away. <laughs> Naturally. They were said to be a foot high. In our number 8 spot we have Irving Wiseman. Irving Wiseman was working at Stanford University as a researcher when he was given permission to inject a mouse with human brain cells. They just wanted to see what would happen. They were instructed to stop the experiment once the human-like behaviors got to a specific point like improved memory or problem solving. Because then they'll have a pinky in the brain sitch and the concept of that only sounds good in the cartoon world. I'm not ready for a mouse world takeover anytime soon. In our number 7 spot we have Gordon Gallup and his team of scientists. Okay, so not saying Gordon Gallup is the evil scientist, but more that all of the scientists that consented to do this in the first place may have been operating from an evil frequency. Or perhaps they were just doing what they were told because it's their job. Because let's be real, the real powerful people that make the decisions are the ones funding such projects as these. But since I have no idea who funded this, as that would probably take too much digging that I don't have time for and it will probably just lead us to the US government, <laughs> we're going to just call this spot Gordon Gallup and his team of scientists. Gordon Gallup was once one of the leading experts in evolutionary psychology and he worked with a team of scientists in the 1920s on interbreeding humans with chimpanzees. He leaked to the press that they were actually successful. The experiment was conducted at the Orange Park Laboratory in Florida. Everyone proceeds to Google the financial backers there. This is where a female chimpanzee was inseminated with human the animal not only became pregnant, but then proceeded to give birth to a living being, a human Z. But get this, they did not allow the human Z to live. After all of that, it was euthanized. What the heck man, potentially harmed this animal by impregnating it only to kill its baby cub. <sighs> My inner future mama bear is poking through and I don't like this. In our number 6 spot we have another group of scientists, the Belgian scientists. It really is so hard to name just one scientist responsible because it really does take a village to raise a child and in this case to create a mutant cow. Yes, a team of Belgian scientists started back in the 1800s to breed native cattle with short horn cattle and over time they only selected the biggest and strongest and eventually that led them to creating the Belgian super cow. A ginormous cow that literally looks like it's on steroids and I'm kind of afraid of it. I'm, I'm very afraid of it. It is unclear why these experiments were being done. I can only assume for more meat. So I guess we can't call these scientists evil per se without a justified reason, but hopefully they have a good one because otherwise, leave those cows alone. In our number five spot, we have Juan Carlos Belmonte. Juan is a biologist at the Salk Institute in California that has been working with other scientists and researchers in China on creating a human animal chimera. Basically, a monkey embryo will be given human cells to create this. Now, before you get upset and say, what for? I think this may arguably be the best reason for doing this kind of experiment. The reason this is being done is to see if animals can possess organs such as livers and kidneys that are entirely human and can be used in the future as organs for transplants. As we do have a transplant shortage around the world, coming up with a solution to this is vital. Apparently every 10 minutes a new person is added to the waiting list for an organ transplant. So at this point it is unclear as to whether the experiment has been completely successful, but I'm sure we'll know in the upcoming years. In our number 4 spot we have Dr. Carl Klauberg. 
This guy is truly very evil. He was a doctor that would work in the infamous monstrous camps that I cannot name due to YouTube violation reasons, so please catch my drift. The monstrous camps during World War II, specifically the Poland camp. Apparently, originally, he was interested in sterilizing all of the women of the camp, and eventually, his interests expanded. He was allowed to experiment on thousands, but only 700 survived. He also artificially inseminated prisoners through a variety of methods and tormented his victims by claiming to have injected animal sp into their womb to create a monster. There are no reports that confirm this to be 100% true, as well as there are no reports of the after effects of this, so we have to conclude that this horrible, uh, unconsented experiment was thankfully a failure. Just pure evil. In our number three spot, we have Hiromitsu Nagauchi. Hiromitsu is a scientist from Japan that is leading a team at the University of Tokyo. He and his team plans to grow human cells in mice and rat embryos and then transport them into surrogate animals, similar to work being done at Stanford University in the US. The goal is yet again to continue to see if animals can produce human organs that can later be transplants for humans. Up until recently, Japan Japan was very strict as to how long the human cells in the embryos were allowed to be kept alive till. But recently the laws changed and they're allowed to be kept until the animal is brought to term. Whoa. This will help so much in terms of what they will be able to find through studying this process. But of course there are many ethical concerns around this experiment such as once this new animal is brought to term, then won't it be a baby? Some claim that this is pure evil to then destroy this baby after, but gosh, I wonder if the decision maker of these experiments struggle with this, cause I definitely would. In our number two spot, we have an unknown evil scientist that created the human sheep. In 2017, villagers of a small town in South Africa were frightened when a local sheep gave birth to a human sheep crossbreed. This is truly terrifying stuff that will haunt your dreams. Like terrifying. It will definitely haunt mine. Imagine human sheep wandering the world. No thanks. Clearly this experiment was done by some evil scientist that decided, heck, I'm going to just let this happen and see how it unfolds. No one knows exactly how it was done, but most think the sheep was just artificially inseminated. The baby born was a stillborn, but if it had made it out alive, I bet you the world would have been on the hunt for the person responsible. In our number one spot, we have Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov. Known from his title, The Red Frankenstein, who was said to have been the creator of artificial insemination. His interest eventually turned into being interested in crossbreeding. In the 1920s, he traveled to Africa after already successfully crossbreeding a zebra and a donkey, he now wanted to crossbreed a human and an ape. Apparently, after a while of living in Africa, he became desperate as his funds became increasingly low that he then began to inseminate African women with chimpanzees without their knowledge. Holy, that's disgusting. Eventually, when people found out about what he was doing, he was shut down and his name was forever tarnished and yeah, I'm glad because that's horrible. Starting off this countdown, we have the wall fin. Take a guess at what two animals were bred for this one. If you guessed a whale and a dolphin, you're correct. A wall fin is a mix between an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and a false killer whale. The first recorded wall fin was born in 1981 in Tokyo SeaWorld. But sadly, he only lived to around six months. Probably a prime example of why they shouldn't exist in the first place. Another wall fin was later born at a sea life park in Hawaii in 1985. But she had trouble reproducing and all her babies sadly passed away. In our ninth spot today, we have the horse human. And this one is going to ruin your day completely. In 2001, a man was caught trying to inject human sperm into a horse. He had done this to about six horses until he was caught by police and arrested. Thankfully, none of the horses got pregnant. But ew. Imagine if they did, woo. In our eighth spot, we have the Iron Age pig. 
Take a look at this porker. He is a chunky guy. The Iron Age pig is a cross between a domestic pig and a wild boar. Now something about that cross just does not sit right with me. Now people like breeding these pigs because they can get a lot of meat out of them or just sell them for a lot. But they are considered very hostile animals. This is due to the fact that wild boars are typically more aggressive. And that's a dominant trait that gets passed along to their offspring. Moving on to number 7 we have the infertile pink bullworm. The pink bullworms are invasive pests that lay eggs on cotton balls. And then once they hatch, the larvae eat the seeds and damage the cotton fibers. In 2005, the situation became so bad that scientists were like, okay, we gotta figure out a solution here. So they decided to create sterile pink bullworms. They did this by treating a bunch of moths with radiation. The radiation would damage their reproductive cells, but it wouldn't kill them. That way, when they encountered a normal pink bullworm and the two mated, bam, it would create an infertile pink bullworm. So for four years, two billion pink bullworm moths that were treated with radiation were released into Arizona's cotton fields. They literally would fly an airplane above the fields and just drop millions of these moths down onto the crops. And it worked. It helped with the bullworm problem. But imagine if their plan didn't work. That could have gone really bad and damaged entire cotton fields. Coming in at number six, we have the sheep with human livers. In 2007, scientists at the University of Nevada, Reno, managed to grow human livers inside of a sheep. They did this by injecting human stem cells from bone marrow into sheep fetuses. Now, they chose sheep as their test subjects because their circulatory system is very similar to ours. In the end, they managed to create livers made with 20% human cells. They are hopeful that one day this can be used to help grow human organs for those in need of a transplant inside these animals. But anything done with animals is highly controversial, especially when it has to do with injecting them with human DNA and stuff. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the cows. I swear, no animal is safe out there, okay? Not even cows. In 2008, British researchers were given the okay to conduct some human animal experiments. As part of the experiment, they decided to manipulate cow eggs. So they took the nucleus of the cow egg, which has the source of the most DNA, and they replaced it with the nucleus of a human cell to create a growing embryo. They then watched the egg develop and multiply. Scientists could then extract the stem cells from this. They hope that one day they can use the stem cells in disease treatments. Moving on to number four, we have the Jeep. And I'm not talking about the car Jeep, we're talking G-E-E-P, okay? A mixture between a goat and a sheep. Now these animals are adorably cute, but sadly breeding the two can be a very risky game. Very few babies are actually carried to term, and even few manage to survive birth. Those that do often have a bunch of genetic abnormalities, but people still cross them together, which is just sad because you're breeding animals destined for failure, and for what reason? Moving on to number three, we have the Jaglion. Can you guys guess what this animal is a mix between? It's kind of obvious. It's a mix between a jaguar and a lion. But these animals are actually naturally born, which is wild. Like, I just can't imagine a jaguar and a lion getting it on. So it first started when a lion and a jaguar coexisted in the same zoo together. They were raised together and well, one thing led to another, bada bing bada boom, mama lion became prego. I shared this love story in another video, but it's so cute but also sad, but I just wanna share it again. So there once was a jaguar named Diablo and a lion named Lola. The two were raised side by side and they were inseparable. When Lola got mature though, they kept Diablo away from her so that they wouldn't mate. But whenever they were apart, both animals got depressed. It got so bad to the point where Lola wouldn't even eat. So they brought them back together and they were happy and eating and thriving again. You can't keep true love apart. And obviously one thing did lead to another and they did end up mating and they had two Jaglian babies together and they all lived happily ever after. Coming in at number two, we have the goat human. I can't with this one. Okay, I just can't. But this image right here is said to be a picture of a human goat baby. Story goes that in 2016 in Alabama, of all places, a goat gave birth to an odd looking baby. In fact, its kid looked very human like. So it's said that this goat was actually the product of a human getting it on with a goat. I know, 
I know it's disgusting. It's disgusting. I threw up in my mouth a little when I read that, but again, this is just a rumor. And in our number one spot today, we have the hybrid lions. Now, this is actually a very sad example of crossbreeding gone wrong. In 2006, nearly two dozen crossbred lions in northern India were dying after they developed a mysterious disease. The disease was a result of inbreeding and a weakened gene pool. Basically, they didn't know this, but they kept breeding lions that all had this weakened gene, and nearly 80 lions were affected by this. The lions being born had weak hind legs and had difficulty walking, and they couldn't run at all. They also had failing immune systems and they weren't living too long. But the worst part was that they let these animals suffer. There's a wildlife law in India which prohibits the killing of animals. So basically, they had to just wait for these lions to die a slow, painful death on their own. It's a very tragic case of breeding gone wrong. Number 10, monkey head transplant. Okay, right off the top, here we go, pun intended. The first ever successful monkey head transplant was back in the early 1970s. I imagine some of your parents may have heard about this. It's probably pretty hard to forget. Maybe ask them about it tonight while they're mid bite at dinner. American researcher Robert White pulled off the otherwise impossible in a slow, tedious operation. White took the head of one monkey and then attached it to a headless monkey. Yeah, add a little time and energy and voila, this actually worked. Yeah, believe it or not, the monkey actually tried to bite one of the surgeons once it came to, which, I mean, totally fair. I'd be a little pissed off too if I just had a different body all of a sudden. Sadly, the monkey passed away nine days later, which is much further than I ever thought. But the fact that this actually happened is one, terrifying, and two, dare I say, miraculous. This is some sci-fi stuff right here. And here you go, new head, enjoy. Number nine, monkey become human. Okay, this next test here is a little less hands-on, so if you have some food, you could probably take a bite during this one. It's safe. Back in 1931, psychologist Winthrop Kellogg, familiar name, he was curious. Yeah, he sat up one night out of the blue and thought, hmm, what would happen if a monkey was raised with humans? Yeah, would it end up like that monkey from MVP, most valuable primate? Would it learn to play hockey for the local team? Or would it learn how to do kickflips with Tony Hawk? No, none of that shit happened. Surprise, surprise. Kellogg brought a baby female chimp named Gua into his home, and this man raised the chimp as if it were another human being alongside his own son, human son, Donald. Yeah, they played, they laughed, they did everything together. But the test ended abruptly after Kellogg's son, Donald, started to make chimp noises. Yeah, and then everyone was like, you know what? I'm good, let's cancel this. Maybe chimps can't learn how to heel flip. We're done, let's go home. So Gua was then, Released. There we go. No more human best friend, you know? Back to normal, dare I say, normal? Number eight, feel the music. Okay, this next one here is a little fun, and we're on a part three, and I have to talk about it. I just have to talk about it. There are many odd experiments in history where humans should have left, you know, human elements out, like music and illicit substances. I can't say what I want to say, but it's white, it's fluffy. It's a bad substance that's white and fluffy. There you go, that's all I'll say. YouTube's like, oh, what is he saying? I can't figure it out. There you go, only, only you and I know. We're too smart for the algorithm. Well, back in 2011, a study was done where rats, just a bunch of rats, were all put in a room and on loop, they played a Miles Davis song. So they're all on said illicit substance, right? That stuff. And they were in a room while Miles Davis played all, all day long. Just smooth jazz all day. I'm not laughing because like it's funny. I'm just, it's the weirdest thing. Imagine walking into this room by accident. You're like, what's going on in here? Oh my God, everyone's all hopped up. Well, before the substances were injected into the test subjects, they all seemed to have calm demeanors while Beethoven played on loop. But after injected, all the rats were neurologically triggered to that smooth, smooth jazz. Yeah, after one week on the sauce, the rats were all of a sudden like, you know what? Miles Davis. Kind of slaps. Been sleeping on Miles Davis this whole time. They're all like, yeah, Miles Davis, really good, so good. Horrible animal research and taxpayers' money. Yeah, we love dark history here on Most Amazing Top 10. Number seven, the first pregnancy test. If you're looking past the ancient Egyptian times and their use of barley and urine to determine if somebody is pregnant, you'll often land on this experiment from the 1930s. Now, it was developed in 1931 by Dr. Maurice Friedman at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, what would happen is doctors would inject they would inject a rabbit with urine from a woman who was suspected of being pregnant. And the rabbit's ovaries could easily tell if that was the case. Accurate test? Yeah. Historical? Of course, it changed the game. Would it also end up with the rabbits passing away? Sadly, also a third yes. It's sad, but more often than not, when humans are involved with any medical process, the test subject dies. You know, before having its head transferred to another animal or something, you're like, what the f 
What's happening here? Number six, small brain and big brain. This next one here, I mean, again, we're on a part three. We're getting into some f***ed up stuff. Here we go. In the early 19th century, humans were figuring out a lot of uh, firsts, you know, especially German researcher Carl August Weinhold. He was on the quest to prove to all that the brain and its nervous system were both attached by wires. Yeah, in order to do so, he took brains and spinal cords of deceased cats and he filled the cavities inside with zinc and silver batteries. And like we know now, the obvious this happened. The bodies began to reanimate as if they were alive again. Huh. It's like it's black magic. Or batteries. Probably batteries. It's definitely the batteries. This was the first time this type of test was done, and now we use electricity and silver for other ways, of course. But thanks to this curious doctor, the early 19th century saw some early Bill Nye the Gross Science Guy stuff. Again, w imagine walking into this room by accident. Like, ho oh, oh, ho, what's going on in here now? Number five, the multi-dog. Ah, nice. I love dogs. Let's get a bunch for the price of none. Back in the 50s, when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a multi-dog, Time Magazine had to cover it. Of course, this is a feat in science. As cruel as it sounds, of course, the adult dog had a newborn grafted to its neck. It's impressive, but also you're like, ew, my God, Jesus. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term, gross. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics, which was the craziest point here. Some say it was playful with its growls, just as the other dog's characteristics would be. It's a sad 1950 Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive for a long time. It just, you know, all of a sudden it was on something's neck and then it was in the next life. That's horrible. Number four, the Great Razor Auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the Great Auk would grow to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were little cute tiny boys. They were cute but quite defenseless, obviously since they're not here anymore. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were all living. Yeah, Newfoundland, go get screeched in and then take out a thousand ox. There we go. It was packed, so they rapidly declined. And by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island. What a d But now, scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs, you know, people, how they have, you know, birds in jars and stuff like that. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor build auk. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore may bring these birds back to life, so. Cute flappy wings may just return. Remember that game Flappy Wings? Disappeared from the app store so quick. Disappeared faster than number three, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled islands all over the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were gray and blue. They didn't have any natural predator until, you know, we came along. Sorry, we got hungry. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. That's where it comes from. They weren't just loved by sailors either. No, monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. And reminder, they were big eggs. So it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681. Again, imagine being that guy, what a dick. But could it be? Could we bring the dodo back to life with science? Yes, apparently, this could be a real thing. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes and we're gonna see them in the sky. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back, you know, animals and stuff. Scientifically, that's a wonderful feat, but do we really think no one's gonna make dodo bird chicken wings? I'm gonna get that on Uber Eats in a year. I can just smell it. Number two, the gastric brooding frog. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Nice, we're getting close to the end, it seems. I'm a big fan of frogs and the gastric brooding frog is particularly interesting to me and also scientists due to their birthing process. If you're eating something, now would be a good time to you know, hit that thumbs up, maybe take a break, put that food to the side for a bit. See, these frogs back, you know, and when they were alive, they would swallow their eggs and then they would hatch them later out of their mouths. Pretty, pretty horrible if you watch that in time lapse, I bet. They're fascinating creatures. And with the Lazarus Project, scientists are actually trying to bring back the Australian gastric brooding frog from extinction. So we might see this horrible act in person. You might go to catch a frog and then all of a sudden it'll be like, Wah! and there's a baby will come out of it and you'll be like, all right, I'm all set actually, how about that? They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists scientists have figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys back out of extinction, it would be one point for Gryffindor. We'd be looking a lot better, that's all I'm saying. And finally, number one, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to end with my girl Martha. The passenger pigeon once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was the 19th century, and it looked a lot different. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block the sun out for a short amount of time. Wow. 
Hashtag flocks that block. We love it. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeon, just is, they're, they're gone, just like that. They're no more. So what exactly happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She sadly passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her past and their extinction. And we found a couple. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated the nicest looking pigeon, arguably. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now they blended passenger pigeon DNA with dinosaur DNA, so that's always exciting. We've seen a few movies on how that can go wrong. We're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, I'm glad science is allowing us to, you know, try again have another go. But look at the pigeons we have now. Those pigeons are hardcore. These things will walk onto the subway with you. Pigeons today will ask you for change. They're ruthless. They're covered in mustard. It's not the same. These graceful birds from the 1910s, I feel like we're bringing back Captain America. You know what I mean? I don't think these old school chaps will appreciate the new game of pigeons. They're a little dirty. I don't know. I don't think they're ready. And I don't think we are either. In our number 10 spot, we have mice with human butts. Okay, so not exactly human butts per se, but with human anal sphincters, which if you don't know what that is, don't worry, I didn't either, I had to look it up. An anal sphincter is a group of muscles at the end of the rectum that surrounds the anus and controls the release of stool, aka Poop. So anyways, in 2011, scientists were able to create a human-mouse hybrid by bioengineering human anal sphincters out of human nerves and muscles and surgically transplanting them onto their rear ends. Yep, sounds horrifying, but this was in fact an experiment that was done with the hope that, if proven successful, the scientists can help humans by making replacement anal sphincters for them. They were quite happy with their results as the mice seemed to take well to them as they fused with the rest of the flesh. They even found that the mice could relax and contract them like their own natural sphincters. Wild. Coming up at our number 9 spot, we have the mouse with the ear. In 1997, a team of Harvard and MIT scientists got together to perform an experiment where they put a scaffolding in the shape of a human ear inside a mouse. It was made of biodegradable materials and so eventually the scaffolding was absorbed into the mouse's body, making a biological ear of flesh and cartilage. This could be removed and actually surgically transplanted onto a human. Whoa, this is truly mind-blowing to me. If this project continued, it could mean great things for plastic surgeons everywhere whom are known to have a hard time reconstructing ears. But of course, this was a very expensive project, so it hasn't been able to continue. I hope the mouse with the ear got to live a long life. In our number eight spot, we have mice with human brains. This is one of those experiments that makes you wonder what the world will look like in 20 years. This is an experiment that was done in 2014 where mice were given millions of human brain cells. Each mouse in the experiment had about 12 million human cells to be in fact, and in the experiment the researchers noticed that the human cells tended to take over the mouse brain cells. Move over, we're more powerful than you. The experiment was quite the success, with the scientists discovering that these mice showed that their memory was four times stronger than a regular mouse's. Unfortunately though, they had to go through some pretty inhumane practices to learn this fact, including playing really loud music and attacking the mice with an electrical shocking tool. They were then able to measure how the mice reacted the next time they heard the sound. Gosh, memory is such a crazy thing to think that sound, smell, taste, sight, touch can all cause pain if there's a specific memory attached to them is honestly wild. In today's seventh spot, we have monkeys with human cells. Okay, so you're probably thinking, isn't this possibly a dangerous experiment as humans and monkeys are already super close to each other in many ways? Well, in 2007, Yale University decided to take the risk and find out. They put human neural stem cells into five different monkeys to analyze how it would affect Parkinson's disease. The experiment proved to be quite successful as the monkeys who suffered with the disease all could eat and walk and move way better than they could before. They also observed that the monkeys had no tumors or tremors and no bad side effects. The experiment was quite ethically controversial even though it was a success and so whether it continues to be done with monkeys in the future is unclear. In our number six spot we have the human 
chimpanzee. Another risky experiment, but one that was done when there wasn't a very high concern for human ethics, so aka a while ago. Apparently in 1967, a group of Chinese scientists were successful in impregnating a chimpanzee with human sperm. Two Chinese scientists have claimed this, but it hasn't been officially confirmed to be true. But from what they have said, they were successful with their experiment, and the chimpanzee was three months pregnant, only to be killed in a horrific attack on the lab, and all of their work was destroyed. It is said that this was due to the Cultural Revolution at the time. In any case, scientists have claimed to want to try this experiment again in the 80s, but nothing came of it. Probably for the best, as it has also been said that they plan to use this human chimpanzee hybrid to drive carts and herd sheep and also send it out to space. This is purely on the basis of it having a human brain, of course. But yeah, maybe ethically not a good reason for creating these creatures. In our number five spot today, we have the human mouse. In a series of experiments in 2010, scientists at the Salk Institute were able to create a mouse with almost an entirely human liver. Whoa. In the past, experiments like this were done on chimpanzees, and there was a lot of controversy over this as there was much speculation in regards to the ethics of this experiment. So the researchers opted for mice to be safe. Honestly, you would think that there would be controversy over all animals, but... Anyways, the project was supposed to study diseases such as hepatitis B and C and malaria. After injecting the mice with the illnesses, the researchers tried testing for a cure. There's been many breakthroughs so far, and so scientists continue to be hopeful with these experiments. In our number four spot today, we have the human pig. An experiment was done in the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota to try and examine how human cells would interact with pig cells if they were to come in contact with each other. Through concoction Conducting this experiment, the clinic was able to successfully produce a pig with human cells. Yes, it was still a pig seemingly on the outside, but on the inside, half of its cells were human. They injected human cells into pig fetuses and voila! a human-pig hybrid. Through doing this experiment, they noticed that the pig cells stayed to one side of the body while the human cells stayed to the other side. But every so often, some of the cells would interact and fuse together to make a brand new DNA, a human-pig DNA. Pretty cool. It would be awesome if they would allow these animals to grow so that they can study them to see if they end up being able to do any humanly functions over time. But as such, that is not the case so far. In our number three spot today, we have human animal milk. Scientists from Russia and Belarus successfully genetically modified goats to produce human breast milk. Since then, scientists from all over have been trying to make the milk more human. As much as the Russian and Belarusian scientists try they only managed to make the milk 60% human with a specific enzyme, lysamine, and the protein, lactoferrin, being apparent. They are usually found in human milk. Apparently a Chinese team made a whole herd of cattle, that's 300 cattle, that produced human milk. The goal is to make human breast milk more available in stores for mothers that can't breastfeed and have to resort to formula. There's talk of the same company wanting to create a human milk cheese, and that is where I draw the line. What is the purpose of this? Just no. In our number two spot today, we have human organs. There is a scientist named Hiromitsu Nagauchi who was given a $1.4 million grant from the US Army to work on developing human animal hybrids with the purpose to create a farm of animals that can be harvested for human hearts and lungs. Of course, one of the biggest reasons for these types of experiments is to see if we can find a way to solve the human organ shortage that is needed for transplants around the world. The idea of creating a farm to harvest these organs would be revolutionary for humans and would give a patient a higher likelihood of getting one and surviving. So an incredible cause, even though the idea of doing it, well, I'm glad I don't have that job. In 2017, Hiromitsu and his team created 186 pig-human hybrids that unfortunately was only allowed to develop for 28 days before they were destroyed. Apparently, his team is currently working on a sheep-human hybrid. They have yet to have complete success, but they feel that they are getting closer and closer. 
Finally coming up in our number one spot today, we have the rabbit man. Yes, you heard that correctly, a man that is a rabbit. I was gonna say, you know, something out of a nightmare, but honestly, nah, a pig man would be way more terrifying. In Shanghai in 2003, a team of scientists successfully infused human cells in rabbit eggs in a laboratory dish, creating an embryo of a new creature that was, yes, you guessed it, half rabbit, half human. Apparently the United States scientists have been trying to perform this experiment for quite some time, but never managed to fully pull it off as none ever survived. In this experiment, the majority of the DNA in the creatures was human, and just a small amount of them was rabbit. Apparently they never allowed the world to see this creature as after a few days of growth, they decided to destroy it and harvest it for stem cells. Damn, why would they go through all of that trouble only to destroy it? We could have possibly had our first talking animal. Oh, humans. Starting off this countdown, we have the human monkey hybrid. Guys, I wish this was fake, but it's not. So scientists are currently trying to make human monkey hybrids. They have high hopes that these experiments will succeed because monkeys and humans are similar genetically. Spanish biologist Juan Carlos Belmonte is working with monkey researchers in China to perform these experiments. So basically they are mixing human cells into monkey embryos. Their objective is to grow a monkey whose organs are completely made out of human cells. They then would use these animals and their organs for people that need the organs. Of course, this is controversial in a number of ways, as you can imagine. In our number nine spot today, we have bees. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. A lot of us know bees as pretty harmless and kind of cute little pollinators, unless of course you're allergic or terrified, but truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went awry and caused a new crossbred bee. This experiment was to take a regular honeybee and breed it with a bee that was found in Africa that produces a lot more honey, and of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honeybee would. Well, the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment and the 80s saw the beginning of the trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kinds of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards humans. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them so they can sting multiple times. Victims of these swarms receive 10 times as many stings as regular swarms. They react to disturbances 10 times faster, and they will also chase the disturbance a quarter of a mile. These bees have actually caused at least 1,000 deaths, so it's safe to say that this is one experiment gone horribly wrong. Moving on at number eight, we have the pig human hybrid. Again, you heard me correctly. Scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences in California have created a human pig hybrid. So in 2017, an embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. Then it was taken out and analyzed and the embryo survived and contained some human cells. So their hope is to grow human organs inside of pigs instead of waiting for a donor. Similar to the tests that are being done on the monkeys as I previously mentioned. No animals are safe at this point. In our number seven spot today, we have the wolfin. I wish I never had to say the word wolfin, but unfortunately they do exist. These guys are created when a female common bottlenose dolphin is bred with a male false killer whale. They're extremely rare and have been found in the wild, but unfortunately most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. The first recorded wolfin was born at the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Probably a prime example of why they really maybe shouldn't even exist in the first place. The first that was born in the United States that actually miraculously survived was at a sea life park in Hawaii in May of 1985. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days. The second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still living. In March of last year, both her and her daughter are still alive, but they still remain in captivity. Coming in at number six, we have Ilya Ivanich Ivanov. What a name. But this is the name of the dude that originally tried to create a human chimp 
hybrid. Ilya was a Russian biologist who did a number of disturbing experiments in the 1920s. He started with crossbreeding animals. So he managed to produce a zebra donkey hybrid, a Z-donk, and a bison cow cross, which is a Zubron, and also crossed rats, mice, guinea pigs, and rabbits together with each other. But he decided to take it further with the human and monkey crossing. In fact, he successfully managed to inseminate three female chimpanzees with human sperm. His experiments were so famous that five women actually offered to carry half-ape babies inside of them in the name of science, which thankfully didn't go through. Or if it did, he did it in private with no one else knowing. In our number five spot today, we have farm cattle. In the 1990s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money for them and their families. This should be amazing and great, right? Well, considering why we're all here today, I think we all know the answer to that question. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great things, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, but also needed way more higher quality food or else they'd stop producing more milk. And they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it's this kind of situation like, yes, they are producing more milk, which will get us some more money, but they also cost us more. And truthfully, most of the times the increased milk production did not outweigh the growing cost. In our fourth spot, we have Hiromitsu Nakuchi. Hiromitsu is a stem cell biologist from Tokyo. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government. And let me tell you what he's planning on doing. Basically, he hopes to grow human cells in mice and rats, and then transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. So again, another experiment having to do with growing human cells in animals. So his experiments started by injecting some cells into rat and mice embryos. But those rodents have been genetically manipulated so they can't make a pancreas for themselves. But his hope is that the rodents' bodies will use the human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. Here's the thing. While conducting the experiments, if they find that the rats are starting to develop a human-type brain, then they have to stop the experiments on them. It's part of the agreement that he has with the government. They don't want a humanized animal coming into existence. In our number three spot today, we have the beefalo. Okay, so beefalo sounds kind of cute and silly and it also looks pretty normal, so what could be wrong with this one? Well, let's start at the beginning. So, a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones started breeding them in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was so exceptionally low. So, bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state and the number remain relatively low because of the limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and there aren't any natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's wild! So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that is really the trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they can obviously clear up a water source pretty quickly. Not to mention the fact that they do their business in the water water and how their heavy weight compacts the soil. Well, basically, they have thrown the ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and the insects and plant life around have also been affected. In our second spot, we have the breeding gone wrong. If you're a dog lover like Olivia and I, then this story is going to make you upset. In 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said she didn't want to keep her. When Julie saw the dog, she was in complete disbelief. The dog had a squished body, huge jaw, a bad underbite, and was oddly shaped. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from a backyard breeder who was carelessly breeding a bunch of his dogs together. Thankfully, Julie took the dog in and gave her a loving home. But it's sad to see dogs born like this just from reckless people who only have money on their mind. In our number one spot today, we have lions. In the 1980s, the Chapier Zoo in India started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has a less shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake as the cubs had severely weak back legs. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune systems started to fail. By 2000, when they had already bred 
bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions, they finally decided to stop the program and all of the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction. There are laws that prohibit them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting for them to die naturally. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. Starting off our list at number 10, new bees. Great, sick of the old ones that sting you in the neck and then you're allergic? We got some new bees now to worry about, here we go. A lot of us know bees are pretty harmless and kind of cute, hairy little pollinators. Unless of course, like I mentioned, you're allergic or terrified of them. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm, obviously, right? Save the bees. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went south. Yeah, this experiment resulted in a new bee, just a dangerous bee. The idea was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces more honey. And of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Good stuff, right? On paper this sounds like a step in the right direction. Well the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. Yeah, liars. You're fired, all 1,000 of you. Get out of here. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and in the 80s, we saw the beginning of a massive trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kind of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards human beings. Nice. And when these guys sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can, you know, continue to Julius Caesar you how many times they want. The victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms, so... Horrible, horrible news. And they react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile. So, hope you can run really fast and really far. Number nine, Wolfen. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male false killer whale. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. They're extremely rare and they have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity because humans are the worst. The first recorded Wolfen was born in the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Didn't even make it one year, horrible. Probably a prime example of why they maybe shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't know, just a wild observation. The first that was born in the United States that actually somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in May 1985, and her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still alive. In March last year, both Kekamalu and her daughter were still alive, but they remain, of course, in captivity. So it's like, great, but not, really not at the same time. Number eight. Farm cattle. Back in the 90s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which in turn would mean more money for them and their families. Awesome, this should be amazing and great news, right? Well, considering why we're here watching, I don't think it's, uh, it's gonna end the way we think, no. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great results, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, great, but they also needed way more food. They needed high quality food as well, or else they'd stop producing more milk and they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it cost them more money, you know what I mean? Yeah, we got more milk, but we have to spend more money on maintaining the damn thing. It's not a win, it's not a win in my book. Number seven, old Buffalo Jones. Here we go, a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones. Let's talk about him. This man started breeding animals in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. Nice, old Buffalo Jones getting his science on. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state, and the numbers remained relatively low because of limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo, good name, found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and therefore aren't any you know, natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's a lot of beefalo. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that has the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and they can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they're sucking it all up, you know what I mean? It's like when you're in school and you're waiting for water and the guy in front of you just keeps drinking. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Where is this going? Not to mention the fact that they do their dirty business in the water and that basically just ruins it all. Basically, they've thrown the entire ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and insects and plant life around have also been infected, all because they're thirsty and they like to take big shits where we all drink our water. 
Thanks, Beefalo. Number six, hybrid lion. Back in the 1980s, in the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller, has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Again, sounds like a great plan at first. How do we make it happen without making weird animals? The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their other two Asiatic lions. Nice. Hey, we'll save ya. Just kidding, even worse. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were all shaky. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune system started to fail more and more. Sadly, by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction further. There's also laws that prohibited them from killing animals so they were simply just waiting around for them to die naturally. It's kind of a weird circle to go. It too. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they just wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. Know what I mean? It was right there and they're like, all right, now let's try something new. It's like, what? No, why? Number five, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing, here we go, halfway through, time to turn it up a bit. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now this was a time before even horses arrived, so they had to do something, right? Large kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pulling plows. These little guys, they were the talk of the town. Imagine hybrid animals before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yeah, yeah, yummy, I wonder what this one is. Smells a little stinky. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. And yeah, it's a wild ass over there. Hey, nice wild ass. It's wild what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from even thousands of years ago. It's mind blowing. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Number four, super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Just tons of a moo, just a mighty moo. Introducing the super cow. All right, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache and shit your super pants. Only in Belgium, let's do it. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmer brought together native cattle and short horn cattle. After that, they would literally pick the biggest of the bunch and then have them breed together. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. I can't even look at these guys. They're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. That makes no sense. They have like eight biceps, the incredible Hulk just with more milk. Number three, the mouse with an ear on its back. Oh, I want to Q-tip this guy every time I see him. The mouse with a human ear, folks. How did this happen? This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. Stuart Little's evil brother. Let's do it. Back in 1997, this Vicanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And clearly it worked a little too well. It's a little odd what we have. We're still talking about it, obviously. It's weird. It all started when Joseph Vicanti, a pediatric surgeon began designing human organs. This was during a shortage in time. He wasn't just bored and started to make ears. He was changing the medical game and little did he know he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. Kind of hard to bring up but we'll do our best. Okay. Chuck failed. He spilled the beans almost right away. But now we know that cow cartilage can create human cells. That's great. I want a Q-tip his back. Is that weird? That's not weird. It gives ear cheese a whole new meaning. We're gonna throw out. Number two, the Zorse. I'll give you a second to figure out what animal this is. Nice, there you go. Male zebra, female horse. Now we've got a really fun word. Zebroids are also quite common historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses and donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. It's pretty cute. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey. All these fun names, right? But again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. These zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip and bizarre? Are. Oh, I know. Humans are not great. Humans are too bored, it seems. And finally, number one, Hiramitsu Nakauchi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This last one is too wild. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here. Not old Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, we're getting to modern science now. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside mice and rats, right? Like we just talked about. But then he wants to transplant those embryos into surrogate animals. 
A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic going in and out. Cells into rats and mice embryos, how do we even get here? We went from Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for you. What? But his hope here was that the rodents' bodies will be used for human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. So it's kind of like a kickoff into biology, right? Here's the thing, while conducting said experiments, they found out that rats were starting to develop a human-type brain. Yeah, that's when they decided to pull the plug, rightfully so. The second humans and animals get too close, governments come in and they go, hey, stop, thanks. Starting off this countdown, we have the baboon human. In October of 1984, Stephanie Faye Beauclair, otherwise known as Baby Faye, was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, meaning the left side of her heart did not grow properly. Sadly, no human heart donor could be found. So they decided to give her the heart of a baboon. In fact, she was the first infant who got a heart from an animal. And at this time, no infant had successfully received a heart transplant, even with a human heart. But it worked for baby Faye. Sadly, she lived for less than a month before passing away. In our ninth spot today, we have the human mouse. Mice are constantly being experimented on in labs. This time, scientists in Japan tried to create a human mouse. Basically, they injected a mouse with human stem cells. They did this in an attempt to grow a human pancreas in the animal. But due to backlash, they have certain rules in place. At any point during the experiment, if the mouse is said to start developing a human type brain, then it has to be killed and the experiments have to stop. Thank gosh though, because uh, I'm not trying to have the world ruled by weird mutant human mice, no thank you. In our eighth spot today, we have the mice with human brain. So I know I just finished saying how the mice were killed if any human DNA was found in the brain, but in 2005, a professor at Stanford University was given permission to create a mouse-human hybrid. He did so by transplanting human brain stem cells into the brains of mice. Now, the main goal of his experiment was to be able to study neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Now, the first couple of rounds did not go so well. They found less than 1% of human cells in the rodent's brain. But by 2010, they found success. That's when they managed to, and I quote, use mouse stem cells to develop sensory hair cells which could combat human hearing loss. They also managed to make the mice more human. As in, the mice with the human brain cells were far more intelligent than the other mice. In our seventh spot, we have the human Z. Over the years, a number of scientists have run some wild tests on chimpanzees. Now, what makes these mammals of interest to them is because of how similar they are to humans. Humans and chimps share 98.8% of their DNA, hence why scientists are trying to make a chimp-human hybrid. Ilya Ivanov was the first person to attempt to create a human-chimp hybrid. Ilya continued these experiments until the 1920s. During that time, the Soviet Union was also running the same experiments. In 2019, rumor has it that a team of researchers from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in the US successfully produced the first human monkey chimeras. So yeah, I don't really know how I feel about that. I don't know. In our six spots, we have the conga. In the early 2000s, when scientists unearthed the conga skeletons in northern Syria, they had no idea what they were looking at. The skeletons looked like they belonged to horses, but they dated back to 2600 BC. And domestic horses wouldn't appear in the region for another 500 years, so they were a bit confused. Then they realized that this wasn't a horse, it was a human bred animal. In fact, this animal was a cross between a donkey and a wild ass. Apparently back then they were highly valuable and very expensive. Now it's believed that these kungas were created for warfare, because not only could they pull wagons, but it was believed that they would be tougher. The thing with donkeys is that they would get scared easily and they didn't need their donkeys running off mid battle but the wild asses, no one could tame them. So then they would breed them together and bam, it created an animal more desirable for them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the human pig hybrid. The whole crossing humans with animal thing definitely creeps me out, but this one isn't what you think. They aren't creating a creature that is half human and half pig. 
thank gosh, at least not yet. Instead, they are using the pigs to grow human organs inside of them instead of having patients wait for a donor. The first experiment was run in 2017, and an embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. Then it was taken out to analyze, and the embryo survived and contained some human cells. Now they are going to figure out if pig embryos can handle enough human cells to create full human organs. However, a lot of people are against these experiments, saying that it is highly unethical. In our fourth spot, we have the dogs. A number of the dog breeds that you love have been severely crossbred. And when dog breeders get overcome by greed, they start to care more about money than they do about their dog's health. Take a look at this dog right here. This is a dog that suffers from short spine syndrome. You can see it has a squished body, huge jaw, and a really bad underbite. The dog was born from backyard breeding. The breeder was carelessly breeding a bunch of his dogs together. And this is the result, which is heartbreaking to see. And most of the time, these dogs are put down as no one wants to adopt them. Coming in at number three, we have the virus Chimera. In 2017, Portuguese researchers decided to mess around with a mouse virus to create a chimera virus. Basically, a mouse virus with a human viral gene. Now, you're probably concerned like me, because I read this and I'm like, oh, they're trying to create another outbreak or something. But no, apparently this allows them to study viruses and how it impacts the rodent's body. But I will say that accidental outbreaks have occurred. In our second spot, we have the rabbit human mix. In 2003, a team of scientists in Shanghai managed to fuse human cells with rabbit eggs. In the United States, scientists have been trying to do the same thing, but their attempts were always unsuccessful. Move over, American scientists, the one in Shanghai beat you to it. Now, this experiment was done to see if it can be used to grow cells or tissues for transplant patients. However, this experiment also had strict rules, and once the rabbit had human cells in its brain, it had to be destroyed. So they only let the human rabbit develop for a couple of days before they killed it and harvested it for stem cells. And in our number one spot today, we have the human demon sheep. Now, this is gonna keep you up at night for sure. In 2017, villagers in South Africa were horrified when a sheep gave birth to something that didn't look like a lamb, okay? In fact, it looked eerily human-like. As a result, people in the village were freaking out, saying that whatever was born was done by the works of the devil. In fact, rumor has it that this lamb was created from someone injecting the sheep with human sperm. Now, the lamb was still born, so it wasn't born alive. But still, how creepy is that? And many people in the village were convinced that beast and or witchcraft were behind this creature. Kicking off the list at number 10, glowfish. I never had a fish tank growing up, but if I did, I probably wouldn't want any hybrid glowy fish bouncing around in there, that's for sure, I don't know. That's what lava lamps are for, no? That's a completely different vibe. You'd be doing this while you're trying to sleep. Trying to dodge out glowfish. Back in 2012, while the world was otherwise, you know, preoccupied with not dying or whatever was supposed to happen in 2012, Yorktown Technologies created a hybrid glowfish. They were first created out of zebra fish, but now there's a whole plethora of glowfish that you can purchase, not just the zebra kind. We got tiger barbs, we got rainbow shark, and betta. I don't know what betta is, but we got them, and they're glowy. We figured out how to make them glowy, I guess to hype up Avatar 2. I think that was supposed to come out back then. I don't see why we needed hybrid glowfish, but here we are. Bioluminescence is natural. We see octopus or deep sea fish that have it naturally, that's cool. But when it's not natural, you can tell. You know what I mean? It looks plasticky. It looks not right. Scientists in Singapore were originally aiming to modify fish to spot toxins in polluted water easier. But then on one hand, you're like, ah, oh, they're pretty mesmerizing. They're glowy, we like them, they're cute. Alan Blake, co-founder of said Yorktown Technologies, wanted them to glow only when near toxins. Yeah, this was back in 2003 when they first started. The guy wanted real life toxin notifications in the water. That's crazy. Oh, toxins, there we go. Good idea, but like, there's other ways, I think. Also, don't fish love shiny things? These guys would be lunch in like a matter of minutes. Today we're at a point where glowfish are being sold to houses for, for reasons. Do you want a glowfish? I, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I don't want any part of that. It doesn't affect them in any way. It doesn't hurt, apparently. Their skin just changes. I don't know. That kind of feels like a big deal to me. I'd be, I'd be like, what's going on? Help. Number nine, see-through frog. Yeah, just when you thought frogs were already hard to spot and catch, boom. 
Now they're invisible, pal. Good luck. Back in 2016, through artificial insemination, scientists successfully took the DNA of two kinds of recessive color mutant frogs. They took black-eyed and gray-eyed frogs, and then they did science. That's what they did. They just smacked them together, and they're like, whoa, that was so easy. They combined them together to create a frog whose skin is always translucent. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason for this. It's cool, but there's also a reason. The see-through factor allows observation of organ growth or cancer formation without having to cut into them, you know what I mean? Kind of helps when you can see the problem, right? No dissection needed for further study. That was the goal here, not bad. But imagine being see-through at all times. I'd be like, hey pal, my eyes are up here, okay? Quit staring at my pancreas. Gotta move on. Number eight. Savannah cats. This one has been talked about for a while now. It's pretty common, weirdly enough. How do we feel about Savannah cats? Let's talk about these little critters. In May 2012, the International Cat Association, I wanna work there, first of all, they registered this Savannah cat as a new official breed. It's official, the international cat community confirmed it. And it all started in the late 80s when Judy Frank crossbred a male several with a domestic Siamese. The offspring was appropriately named Savannah, yeah. Imagine if I was like, no, it's actually Amanda. I lied to you. They just called them Savannah cats for no reason. In turn, now we have cats with big ears. We did it, folks. We did it. Domestic cats mixed with wild African cats. I mean, it sounds like you're going to get another cat. And we did. Great work. I don't know how to tell you this. I mean, apparently they're great. They're not too crazy temper-wise, but they're fun and energetic at the same time. Apparently they're great for families. Yeah, I can't believe I'm saying great for families in a list that gets as dark as it's gonna get. Number seven, the Zorse. The Zorse. Yes, the male zebra, female horse. Now we get a really fun word. Zorse, the Zorse, sorry. It sounds like a god. Yeah, there's Thor, Odin, and then Zorse. Zebroids, that's their scientific name, they're usually quite common, historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses, donkeys, you name it, has been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. So they're very little petite little guys. In 2010, a zedonk was born. It was a zebra donkey, but again, back in the 70s, this happened before, and no one really talked about it. There were three born in Colchester Zoo. Yeah, those zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip? Bizarre, humans are so weird. They're not too smart, humans. They're like, yeah, let's put these in a cage. It'll be fine. Number six, bees. I hate bees so much. When the window's closed, we're good. Remember when we had to worry about killer bees for a couple months, like a year ago? during an already dark time. Should we still be worried? Are these killer bees coming back? Are they a real thing? Hybrid bees, those are also, huh? Will hybrid bees fight the killer bees? Can we watch this? Can we tune in and watch this on Triller? An experiment in the 70s tried to change the hashtag bee game. And in turn, we got a brand new bee. Yeah, we love those, just new bees to dodge outside. The idea at first was to take a regular honeybee and then breed it with an African honeybee. Ideally, we would get a hybrid bee that can safely safely provide more honey than a regular honeybee. Okay, that's steps. We're going towards the future of this one, right? On paper. The experiment obviously didn't work with these new bees and they didn't do that at all. And worst part of all, the bees got out. Yeah, imagine that email to whom it may concern. Oh God, I left the door open, I'm sorry. These bees are aggressive towards other kinds of bees. They're not too nice, they're not too friendly. And they're very aggressive towards humans as well, in case you were wondering. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them afterwards so they can continue stinging multiple times with their stinger butts. Yeah, they don't fall off, right? That's our only hope when we see a bee the size of a tennis ball. We're like, uh, he won't, will he? Will he? I don't think. These bees would, because they can. Yeah, hybrid killer bees. Victims have received 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms. It's a lot, it's a lot of stings, it's a lot of movements from the bee's hips there. That's like some Caesar, that's like the Julius Caesar numbers right there, that's crazy. They react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile to find it. So yeah, don't sneeze. Hm. These bees have caused over 1,000 deaths. So yeah, I, would, I guess we should worry. We should definitely worry. Hit that thumbs up just because we're like, uh, no, there's, there's no, there's no good in this. That's scary, that's so scary. Hit that thumbs up for bee progression. Let's save the bees, Hit the thumbs up for the bees. Let's save all the bees except for those kinds. The other ones are good. Number five, Tigons. Tigons be bygones, ha <laughs> ha. He's good. I was gonna say Liger, but that's been used before. We know what that one looks like. Tigons were a real hybrid animal you could see for yourself at both the London Zoo and the Manchester Zoo once upon a time. This was of course back in the late 30s where folks didn't you know, bat an eye towards these kind of things with animals. Yeah, yeah, step on up and see the Tigon. A tiger head, a lion body, and a tiger tail. That's what happens when you put animals in the same cage. Come on out. Well, sometimes they'll get along too well in said cage, and then you'll get a Tigon. Tigon hybrids were seen long before the 90s. Actually, 1837, Queen Victoria was gifted a Tigon. Imagine that. I wouldn't know what to do with that. I'd be like, hi, 
What are you? Number four, Hiramitsu Nakachi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This one is insane. Now we're getting to the dark ones here. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here, not just, you know, Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, this is modern science. This is some Black Mirror type stuff here. Hiramitsu hopes to grow human cells inside of mice and rats, and then transplant set embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic, a lot of moving around, and a lot of science, apparently. Cells into rats rats and mice embryos. How did we even get here? Who thought of this first? We went from the Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for themselves. I like the word pancreas. I've been using it a few times lately. But his hope was that the rodent bodies would use the human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. Here's the thing though, while conducting said experiments, they found that the rats were starting to develop a human type brain. That's when they pulled the plug on that entire project. Yeah, the second humans and animals get too close, governments will come in and go, stop. Number three, beefalo. Beefalo sounds like a Pokemon. It sounds like a thing that's close to being real, but shouldn't be. And that's where it should have stayed, if I'm being honest. The beefalo should have only been a concept. But then a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones did the impossible. Look at him go. One day in 1906, he said, hey, watch this, and then started breeding Arizona bison with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. You know, just something new to make some money. He ended up giving up on this project entirely and then he just released the animals. Yeah, guy just got bored and released science projects to the wilds. What could go wrong? The beefalo then found their way into a national park where hunting was banned, so they thrived. And they thrived without natural predators at that. The population began to grow by 50% every single year. And at first you're like, wow, we did it. This is like Jurassic Park, but cute. No, their environmental impact was horrible. It was not ideal. They played God. They messed with the circle of life. You eat one bug, then there's a hurricane somewhere else. First off, these guys are very thirsty animals. They can consume 10 gallons of water each trip to a watering hole. They're like that one kid growing up drinking at the water fountain. You're like, guy. Save some. Please hurry. I'm so thirsty. Yeah, they drank all the water. Every animal was so thirsty after. They also, uh, and said water, so they ruined the entire water park for every other animal involved. Yeah, all bad. Entire ecosystems were messed up at this point. Everybody got thirsty because Charles Buffalo Jones was like, hey, watch this, let's try something new. Number two, don't try this at home. Not sure how many times I have to say this, but don't try any crossbreeding at home or ever for that matter. Because things go south, obviously. For example, back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said that she didn't want to keep her. This is normal, maybe a kid will come into the, the picture, maybe the dog's too aggressive, whatever, and then they have to give it back, okay. When Julie saw the dog, she was in shock. She was like, yeah, I'll take this living animal, first of all, I'm not a monster, thank you, I can do this. People who abandon animals, also, they're the devil, side note. This dog was different, but it wasn't mean, it was just a high Hybrid. It wasn't healthy, but all the more reason why you should stick around. Know what I mean? The dog had a squished body, it had a huge jaw, and a bad underbite, and it was oddly shaped. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from this backyard breeder who was carelessly breeding a bunch of dogs together, just for fun, not really knowing what he's doing. Thankfully, Julie did know what she was doing. She brought the dog home and gave her a loving home. Sweet little thing. Olivia and I want a dog so badly, so you know what? We'll take this hybrid little lady anytime. Her name's Kuda. She's in great hands, but. Look at her, she's so cute. And finally, number one, lions. Back in the 80s, the Chatbar Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they tried this fun little science experiment for themselves, yeah. They tried an experimental program, rather, where they would breed together domestic lions, little petite, you know, well, small in terms of a lion. They would mix them with these massive, beastly African lions in the hopes that they would meet in the middle somewhere and be introduced to the wild and help with the dying population of wild lions in India. Again, on paper, we wanted to get involved, we want to help restructure the lives of this animal, but the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. And it didn't, obviously it's number one, it didn't work. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake. The cubs had weak back legs, they were having extreme trouble walking, and as they got older, their immune systems just started to fail faster and faster. By 2000, they'd bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. That's a lot of, it's a lot of projects, a lot of experiments. So they finally decided to stop the program, thankfully, and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction, which is so odd to me. Like, I'm not a fan of humans at all at this point. They're like, hey, welcome to Earth. Yeah, it kind of sucks, right? It's hot. Okay, cool, we're gonna stop making you now. Cheers. What? Naturally, thankfully, there are laws that prohibit officials from just killing these animals, so now they're just simply waiting for them to die naturally, which is, it's better. It's certainly better, but still, stop messing with nature, guys. What do I have to, how many times do I have to tell you? Stop messing with nature. Starting off this countdown, we have a Zorse. Now, this is a mix between a zebra 
and a horse, which just why? Scientists are out here just breeding animals that kind of have similar features just to see what will happen and what their offspring will look like, which a lot of people fear because what if we cross the wrong thing and then create a dominant invasive species? Anyways, these animals were created after crossbreeding a male zebra with a female horse. The offspring look more like a horse than the zebra, but they still have their key identifying stripes. The first Zorse was created during the 19th century by Charles Darwin. They are still around to this day, but are extremely rare. This is because Zorses are infertile. They can't reproduce on their own. So the only way we can create these animals is if scientists force breed them. In our ninth spot, we have the Zubron. Now, you might be thinking, this is a cross with some animal and a zebra. Well, that's what I thought, but I was wrong. This is a cross between domestic cattle and the European bison. Bison, bison, whatever. Zubrons were first created by Leopold Wallicki in 1847, but scientists didn't breed the first fertile Zubron until 1960. In fact, after World War I, a lot of people believed that Zubrons were going to replace domestic cattle because they were at a lower risk of developing diseases. So all throughout the 1950s and 60s, scientists were working on creating these animals in labs, which I mean any animal born in a lab always receives backlash and is subject to a number of controversies. But in the late 1980s, the experiments were shut down. Nowadays, there's only one herd left on Earth. Moving on to number eight, we have the humans with animal valves. When humans need to have a heart valve transplant, they have a couple of options. Either they can get a biological heart valve replacement or a mechanical heart valve replacement. Biological heart valve replacements are made from animal tissues, such as tissues from sheep, pigs, cows, even horses. In fact, many people walking around today are able to do so only because their hearts contain valves taken from animals. It's kind of trippy. In our seventh spot, we have Dan and Mary Gari. Dan and Mary Gari are transplant cardiologists who have managed to grow human muscle cells in pig embryos. They are now trying to grow human vasculature in pigs as well. The thing that they are worried about though is having someone's body reject the organs because it contains blood vessels from pigs. Now, how did they go about this experiment? Well, they deleted the genes in the pig embryos that they would need to develop certain tissues. Then they inject modified human cells in there. After 17 to 27 days, the embryos made muscle tissues formed entirely of human cells. Moving on to number six, we have the Leopon. A Leopon is a mix between a male leopard and a female lion. And I swear every photo of them look fake or edited. It's because Leopons have a head of a lion with its mane, but then a body of a leopard with all its spots. Like it doesn't look real at all. It looks like someone photoshopped the two animals together. But alas, they are real and low-key terrifying. They can grow to be larger than their full-grown leopard father. Like, they are massive. The first reference to the Leopon was back in the first century by Roman author and naturalist Pliny the Elder. But it wasn't until 1910 that someone saw one in real life out in the wild. But again, controversy with these guys is that leopards and lions don't naturally mate with each other. They are forced to breed in captivity together. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the farm cattle. Back in the 1990s, farmers in India were led to believe that if they crossbred their cattle, then they would be able to create cattle that would produce more milk. So they were like, hell yeah, more milk equals more money. Sure, let's do it. So they ended up crossing different breeds of bulls together and with cows. But this had huge consequences for the farmers. In the end, they created cattle that would produce more milk, but needed to be fed more and needed higher quality food or else it wouldn't produce milk at all. Also, they were more prone to disease, so their vet bills were high. In the end, the cons outweighed the pros. They had to learn this the hard way. Moving on to number four, we have Hiromitsu Nakochi. Hiromitsu Nakochi is a stem cell biologist from Tokyo. He is determined to use animals to produce human cells or organs. Basically, he hopes to grow human cells in mice and rats and then transplant 
transplant those embryos into bigger surrogate animals like sheep or pigs. Here's the thing, he's got restrictions. If while conducting the experiments, the rats or any animal starts to become more human like, then they have to stop the experiments on them. It's part of the agreement he has with the government. They don't want humanized animals coming into existence, and neither do I. Moving on to number three, we have the pig embryos. So, in all parts of these series, we talked about how scientists like to use pigs for their experiments. Well, here's another group of researchers running tests on pigs. Scientists are currently working on growing kidneys in pigs. This team is collecting small samples of human blood or skin, and then the cells are separated, cultured, and then treated with different drugs. Next, the technician selects a pig embryo that was altered so that it lacks the gene that it would need to grow its own kidneys. So then, the human cells were injected into it so it would grow human kidneys instead. Their hope is that when the pigs grow, they can then remove the human kidneys and then transplant it into the recipient's bodies. In fact, in the US alone, around 20 people die every day waiting for transplants, so this could help them. In our second spot, we have monkey human embryos. I'm telling you, scientists are running too many experiments on monkeys and chimps, and I'm not fond of the idea of having monkeys and humans crossing, you know, hello, planet of the apes, no thank you. Anyways, an international team of scientists introduced human stem cells into monkey embryos and maintained these embryos in culture. Some of the embryos live for up to 19 days, but only a small minority of the ones that had human cells in them did actually survive. And and in our number one spot today, we have the Growler Bear. And honestly, I just like saying its name. Like, it sounds funny. Like, Growler. I love it. Anyways, this is a cross between a polar bear and a brown grizzly bear. I kid you not, sometimes they call it the Pizzly Bear. But it sounds like piss, so let's just stick with Growler. Now, Here's the thing, the reason why these bears are mating is actually really sad. Because of climate change, polar bears have less and less partners to mate with. So out of desperation, they're mating with grizzly bears. It's really sad. It's believed that the first growler bear was discovered in 2006. On April 16th, 2006, a hunter named Jim Martle was out hunting when he captured a growler bear. At first, he thought it was just a polar bear, but officials took a look at it and noticed that it had strange features. Later, it was determined that it was a growler bear.